emerald tablet, also known as the Smaragdine tablet or tabula smaragdina. Smaragdina is a compact or cryptic piece of hermetica. Right, important word right there. Reputed to contain the secret of the prima materia and its transmutation. You hear this? It was highly regarded by European alchemists, okay, as the foundation of their art and its hermetic tradition. Okay, this word was started the whole hermetic tradition. You know what that is about. The original source of the Emerald Tablet is unknown. Although Hermes Trigemestus is the author named in the text. And again, Hermes, we read earlier about Thoth, is also known as Hermes in Greek. So it's the same person. You're going to hear that back back and forth a lot. So don't get confused. It's first known appearance in, in a book written in Arabic between the 6th and 8th centuries. Very important again, Arabic. It first sources in Arabic. Why Arabic? We'll see that later. The text was first translated into Latin in the 12th century. Numerous translations, interpretations, and commentaries followed. Modern occultists suggest that some hermetic te texts may be of pharaonic origin and that the legendary 42 essential texts that contain the core her hermetic religious beliefs and philosophy of life remain hidden in a secret library. Some trans readings of Edgar Cayce reveal that Hermes, or Thoth, was an engineer from the submerged Atlantis who also built, designed, or directed the construction of the pyramids of Egypt. It says in about 300 AD, Sosimos provided one of the first definitions of alchemy as the study of the composition of waters, movement, growth, and embodying and disembodying, drawing the spirits from bodies and bonding the spirits within bodies. In general, Sosimos most understanding of alchemy reflects the influence of hermetic and Gnostic spiritualities. The word alchemy was borrowed from Old French, alchemia, alchemy, taken from medieval Latin, alchemia, and which is in turn borrowed from Arabic, alchemia. The Arabic word is borrowed from late Greek, kemeia, kemia, with the agglutination, agglutination of the Arabic definite article. This ancient Greek word was derived from the early Greek name for Egypt. Okay? Chemia, based on the Egyptian name for Egypt, Chem, Black Earth, as opposed to the Red Desert Sand. So the medieval Latin form was influenced by Greek Chimeia, meaning mixture, and referring to pharmaceutical chemistries. The central figure in mythology of alchemy is Hermes Trismegistus, or Tris Great Hermes. His name is derived from the god Thoth and his Greek counterpart Hermes. So these three people are the same entity, same person. Hermes and his caduceus or serpent staff were among alchemy's principal symbols. According to Clement of Alexandria, he wrote that he wrote what were called the 42 books of Hermes, covering all fields of knowledge. The Hermetica of Trice Great Hermes is generally understood to form the basis for Western alchemical philosophy and practice, called the Hermetic philosophy, by its early practitioners. These writings were collected in the first centuries of the Common Era. And Hermes Trismegistus or Gistus, is purported author of the Hermetic Corpus, a series of sacred texts that are basis of Hermetism. And it says the name means thrice greatest Hermes, or three times great. Origin and identity, it says here about Hermes, Trim Trimegistus, may be a representation of the syncretic combination of the Greek god Hermes and Egyptian god Thoth. Greek and Hellenistic Egypt recognize the equivalence of Hermes and Thoth. Consequently, the two gods were worshipped as one in what had been the temple of Thoth and Chemnu, the temple of Thoth and Chem knew, which the Greeks called Hermopolis. It says here, the Hermetic literature among the Egyptians, which was concerned with conjuring spirits and animating statues, informed the oldest Hellenistic writings on Greco-Babylonian astrology and on the newly developed practice of alchemy. In parallel tra tradition, Hermetic philosophy rationalized and systematized religious cult practices and offered an adept 
a means of personal ascension from constraints of physical being. Right, it says here, the Hermetica is a category of papyri containing spells and initiatory induction procedures. The dialogue called the Aclepius, after the Greek god of healing, describes the art of imprisoning the souls of demons or angels in statues with the help of herbs, gems, and odors, so that the statue could speak and engage in prophecy. In other papyri, there are recipes for con constructing such images and animating them, such as when images are to be fashioned hollow so as to enclose a magic name inscribed on a gold leaf. Okay, you see what, what this is, Hermetica? Are you reading this with me? And again, Etymology Online says here, Thoth, ancient Egyptian god of wisdom and magic, hieroglyphics, and the reckoning of time, from Latin, from Greek, Thoth, from Egyptian, Tehudi, usually rep represented as a human figure with the head of an beast, by the Greeks assimilated to their Hermes. Okay, same person. Hermetic. 1630s dealing with the occult science or alchemy, occult science or alchemy, from Latin Hermeticus, from Greek Hermes, god of science and art, among other things, who was identified by Neoplatonist mystics and alchemists with the Egyptian god Thoth as Hermes Trismegistus, thrice great Hermes, who supposedly invented the process of making glass tube airtight, a process in alchemy using a secret seal, hence completely sealed. Secret societies, secret proceedings, masons. Also called Hermetism is a religious, philosophical, and esoteric tradition based on primarily upon writings attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, thrice great. These writings have greatly influenced the Western esoteric tradition and were considered to be of great importance during both the Renaissance and the Reformation. So can we discern? So let's continue. It says regarding Hermetism, it says here in late antiquity, Hermetism emerged in parallel with early Christianity. You hear this? Parallel with early Christianity, right? So in late antiquity, Hermetism emerged in parallel with early Christianity, Gnosticism, Neoplatonism the Chaldean oracles, and the late Orphic and Pythagorean literature. These doctrines were characterized by resistance to the dominance of either pure rationality or doctrinal faith. The books now known as the Corpus Hermeticum were part of the renaissance of syncretistic and intellectualized pagan thought that took place from the 3rd to the 7th century AD. It says here, in modern era, in 1945, hermetic texts were found near the Egyptian town of Nag Hammadi. So these are real, you see, they were found. One of these texts had the form of a conversation between Hermes and Asclepius. So Hermes ain't fiction, all right? A second text titled On the Ogdot and Enya told of the hermetic mystery schools. All right, so this is what I was talking about, the mystery schools. And these secret societies they started establishing with this knowledge that Toph, Hermes, was teaching. It was written in the Coptic language, the latest and final form in which the Egyptian language was written. And it says here, according to G Giza Vermes, Hermetism was a Hellenistic mysticism contemporaneous with the fourth gospel. You hear this? Okay. And Hermes, Tre Tresmegistus, was the Hellenized reincarnation of the Egyptian deity Thoth, the source of wisdom, who was believed to defy man through knowledge, or as they say here, Gnosis, Gnosticism. So look how he, what he influenced as well. And Gilles Quiskel says, it is not completely certain that there existed before and after the beginning of Christian era in Alexandria a secret society akin to a Masonic lodge. All right, so real quick, we go to online etymology dictionary, just real quick, just for reference again, so we know, you know, that it has uh, a whole Hellenistic Hermetic uh, beginning, this whole Egyptian, uh, ancient Egyptian, at least, uh, background, right? Now, looking at the word Egypt, on online etymology dictionary, what does it say here? The etymology says Old English, eh, Hipte, the Egyptians. 
from French Egypte, from Greek Aegyptos, the river now, Egypt, from Amarna Ikupta, corresponding to Egyptian Hakapakta, temple of the soul of Pita or Ta, the creative god associated with Memphis, the ancient city of Egypt. All right, so hold up. Remember earlier we got the Aegyptus, that was a whole Greek god that gave the name to this uh, land in, right there in that region of the world. They gave it under that name. But uh, in reality, Egypt more was like the place where the temple of Pita or the temple of Pa, because the P, I guess, is not pronounced. Much love to respect again to UBTV for the info, for the uh, knowledge. And uh, so Egypt, again, this is a Greek word. Egypt. Remember, we're going to see a video uh, right after this about uh, the true name of ancient Egypt, what they call it themselves, or at least what they interpret it, right, and based on their translations. Uh, but again, Egypt, it was a really, it's nothing to do with a landmass in Africa. It has nothing to do with a landmass in Africa. Are you seeing this clearly? It's more the Temple of Ta, or the House of Ta, which was in association with Memphis, the ancient city of so-called Egypt. Memphis, we have a Memphis here in America, which is right next to our Great River, which the now is a Greek word again. That means Great River. So we have a Great River, the Mississippi, which also has a city right next to it, Mount Memphis, right? This whole area was, you know, known as Little Egypt. We know it's very fertile there. We know the mound builders were all over there. So where are we really talking about? When we're talking about this temple or this mound of the house of Pita, the creative god associated with Memphis. It says here, right in the bottom, it says strictly one of the names of Memphis. So it was really the name of Memphis. It had nothing to do. So where was Memphis? It was a taken by the Greeks as the name of the whole country. For from there, the Greeks, the Greeks, remember, they gave it to Aegyptus. They grabbed it and was like, yo, let's just call it Aegyptus after our Greek god, Aegyptus. The whole country as the name is the whole country strictly one it used to be the name just for memphis or the temple where memphis was right this temple this place the egyptian name kemet now the egyptian name kemet means black country possibly in reference to the rich delta soil not to skin complexion rich delta soil not complexion kemet means rich or fertile soil the Arabic is Mizr, which is derived from Mizraim, the name of his son, a biblical him. So are we going to go biblical when we talk about Mizraim or Memphis? Because that's really what they get the Memphis from after Mizraim. They get the Memphis or Menis. Mizraim, Memphis, and Menis, same place, uh, same person, I'm sorry. Mizraim, Memphis, or Menis, King Menis, the very first official, supposedly, right? If we're going to go biblical, we're going to use Memphis. Well, you have to use Mizraim. Again, it's the name of a son of biblical Ham, Hamite, Egypt, Aegyptus, Greek, Kemet, fertile soil. None of this, none of these have to do with a landmass in Africa. So right here, this all kills it. Anything you got to show me, talk about when you talk about Kemet and all this and ancient Egypt and Kemet, none of that talks about any landmass in Africa. All right, Kemet. Again, one of the ancient Egyptian names of the country, Kemet, KMT, or Black Land, from Kem, Black, is derived from the fertile black soils, not from skin color, not from the skin color of the people. They're talking about the fertile black soils, black soil, fertile black soil, rich, deposited by the Nile floods. All right, the Nile, Nile is a Greek word. All right, it means great river. Distinct from the desert or red land of the desert, the name is realized as Kimi and Kima in the Coptic stage of Egyptian language and appeared in early Greek ex Kimia. Remember, we just went through the Kimia uh, etymology, alchemy, in my old video, Dov, alchemy, chem chemistry, or alchemy. Another name was Tmeri, Tmeri, land of the river bank, Tmeri, land of the river bank, the great river, the real one. The names of Upper and Lower Egypt were Tashim and Seshland and uh, Tamihi, Northland, respectively. All right, so again, nothing about a landmass, nothing about a landmass in Africa, because Kemen means rich, fertile black soil. We have plenty of rich, fertile black soil. So, real quick, origin of the name Nile, it says here in the ancient Egyptian language, 
what language? The noun was called Iteru River, which meant Great River. Iteru River, which meant Great River. The word now comes from the Arabic Nil, N-I-L, which in the Greek language was translated as Nilos, meaning River Valley. All right. So where in any of this, where in any of this does it say a river in Africa? Where does it say this a river in Africa? You get what I'm saying? The etymology does not prove that it's located in Africa, meaning really Great River, Great River. All right, so Great River, right? So Mississippi River, right? We go down to the name and significance. It says here the word Mississippi itself comes from Mississippi, the French rendering of the Anishinaabe or Ojibwe or Chippewa people, right? Or an Algonquin name for the river Mississippi. Great River. Same thing. Mississippi is the Great River. All right. And just one more. It says here, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Information about the Upper Mississippi River. Well, we just want to know this. It says Mississippi is an Ojibwe, Chippewa, Indian word, meaning Great River or gathering of waters, gathering of waters great river or gathering of waters now we go back to the origin of the name nile it says in the ancient egyptian language the nile was called itero river which meant great river in the arabic and 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 greek it meant river valley or just like saying gathering of the water gathering of the rivers gathering of waters river valley Great River. Go back again. Meaning Great River. Same thing. So where's the real Nile or Great River or the gathering of waters? Where is that? All right. So again, think about it. Where can you really see a great gathering of waters or a great river? Look at this image right here. Look at all the uh, river tr tributaries that come into the Mississippi or the Great River. The Great River, the original Great River, a real river, a real Great River, a real Nilos, Nilos. That's what it means, Nilos. The word Nilos, Nile, means Great River or a gathering of waters. Look at this. Look at this gathering of waters. Look at all this water gathering together. Look at this. All right. So we got. Along the whole Mississippi River, we got mounds. All right, so where's ancient Tamari? Where's the real needles? Where's the ancient Egypt for real? And now we're going to read from uh, this book right here I found. Not out of Africa. How Afrocentrism became an excuse to teach myth as history. This is by Mary Lefkowitz. Fair use. Thank you for writing this so we can read it. All right. So I'm going to go uh, belly flop to a part in the preface of this book. And she says here, talking about why they focus on Greek history, most of the uh, Afrocentrist. says here, the explanation is that only 160 years ago, it was widely believed that Egypt was the mother of Western civilization. Although shown to be untrue, it's not true. As soon as more information about Egypt became available, the earlier beliefs survived in the mythology of Freemasonry. All right. So Freemasonry was the ones that were given Egypt the credit. What Egypt? And why Freemasons choosing Egypt? Right. So the mythology of Freemasonry. The Masons believe that their rituals derive from Egypt. But in reality, their rituals do not originate from a real Egyptian source and are not nearly so ancient as they suppose. Rather, they derive from the description in an 18th century novel of an Egyptian mystery system, which served as means of providing university level education and as the source of ancient philosophy. This system, although wholly fictional, was in fact based on Greek sources. All right, get what they're trying to tell you here, right? We're gonna get into this a little bit more, but we know a lot of the most of the ancient Greek before it was supposedly translated, right? In the 1800s, supposedly the Rosetta Stone, right? We're going to get to that. But before that, supposedly all the history we were getting, it was from the accounts of the Greeks. It was all Greek history we were getting of the Egyptians. All right. 
but it's really more mythology of Freemasonry. The mythology, the Masons, right? From an Egyptian mystery system that was actually brought out in the 18th century, meaning the 1700s. The system of the holy fiction was in fact based on Greek sources. And although no one knew it at the time, these ancient sources were themselves inaccurate because their authors interpreted Egyptian culture in terms of Greek custom and experience. I remember Egypt, Egypt was the etymology. It's a Greek word. We're going to get to that Greek customs and experience terms of Greek. Although the Egypt in parentheses and these accounts never existed. It never existed. What do you mean never existed? You see what they're saying here, right? Wake up. The ancient writers nonetheless believed it. And the Freemasons still talk as if they had some direct connection with it. All right. They say, oh, we descend. We are the reincarnation of the Pharaoh, blah, 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 blah. And that's what they do. We're going to talk about this a little bit, too. All right. But they're the ones who are, you know, and they have a lot of power, right? Influence because of their conviction that what they are saying is true. Their reports can appear credible, especially to people who do not have an extensive knowledge of the ancient world. I just want to read here what she's saying. Continua says, in the fourth chapter, I explain why certain Afrocentrist writers have come to believe that there was in ancient times an ancient mystery system. I will argue that in reality, this system was an invention of an 18th century French writer, the Abbe Jean Terrasson, right? Look him up. The mysteries he described were in character Greco-Roman. In other words, when Afrocentrists accused the Greeks of stealing from the Egyptians, the Egyptian ideas that they are describing are not actually Egyptian, but rather Egyptian in parentheses as imagined by Europeans who had no direct or authentic knowledge about Tamari. Remember, it's not even Egypt. It's Tamari of America. Remember, that's why they had to make it up. To say that the Greeks stole their philosophy from Egypt is tantamount to saying that they stole their philosophy from themselves. So she has a point here. She's saying... How could the Greeks have stolen it from the African, right, so-called Egyptians from ancient times? If even the basis of what they're basing their whole modern Egyptology is based off this whole Egyptian mystery system that was created in the 1700s by this French guy based on what Europeans imagined uh, Egypt to be. All right, so we're continuing the book. Uh, in this part, she is uh, criticizing uh, somebody we're going to get uh, to know here in case you have and heard him. One of the people who actually a part of the whole Pan-African uh, origin um, doctrines. Uh, Chik Anta Diop. All right. It says in his influential book, Civilization or Barbarism, which was originally published in French. All right. So he wrote it in French. All right, is he African? Yeah, he lived in Senegal and he spoke Wolof, but... Is this an ancient French person, French family? There you are. You're going to read how he is aristocratic. All right, we're going to see. So he wrote it in French in 1981. The Senegalese humanist and scientist Chic Antadiop undertook to construct a usable path for African people. He regarded Egypt as the source of much of what is called Western civilization. He suggested that according to the Greek mythology, the Egyptians brought their civilization to Greece during the time of the 17th or 18th dynasty in Egypt, 1574 to 1293. Diop's suggestion that the Naus was Egyptian is slightly less far-fetched. He was Egyptian in the sense that he was born in Egypt. What Egypt? Again. But according to the myth, his family was actually Greek in origin. His great-grandfather, Epaphos, was born in Egypt after his mother, Lo, the daughter of the river Inakos and Argos, had come to the Nau. Delta. So he's saying these people were actually Greek. All these people he's calling Egyptian. A lot of these people were actually Greek, especially I'm going to show you uh, Danaus, actually the brother of Aegyptus, the son of Belus. All right. These are Greek gods. All right. So let me just show you real quick. Aegyptus, right? We're just in Wikipedia. We're just, you know, surfing the wave right here real quick. All right. Because in Greek mythology, Aegyptus or Aegyptus was a legendary king of ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt, right? To marry the real Egypt, the real Tamari, ancient Egypt, not modern day uh, theme parks, right? UB News, much love. Now, it says here he was a descendant of the Prince's Lo through his father Belus, all right? And of the river god Nilius through Akuri, his mother. So these are all Greek people, 
he was just born in ancient and where in Tamari he was born, not even in Africa. It says in Tamari, ancient. We're not talking about an African a landmass in Africa. I Egypt was with the son of King Belus of Egypt and Akiori, a naive daughter of the Nile. He was the twin brother of Danaus, all right? He's the twin brother. So his brother, Danaus, king of Libya. Some say Aegyptus is Jacob. Some say Aegyptus is Jacob. So that would make Danaus Isau, uh, his twin brother Isau in Greek uh, genealogy. But that's something we're going to research and do a video about. We're going to get into that. But I just wanted to show you, all right? This is where the names are coming from. It's not even uh, uh, what they're calling Egyptian word. This is Greek words, Greek history, Greek genealogy. Again, we're going back to the book. She's letting you know. But according to the myth, again, his family was Greek in origin. All right, here's a little figure. She got a little family tree. All right, Zeus, Lopo, Libya, Poseidon, so Belus. So Egypt's granddaddy is Poseidon, Libya, and Poseidon, Belus is that. Egypt's Danaus. Aegyptus and Danaus. So she continues, you know, she's saying Diop, you know, the Senegalese, uh, you know, Pan African says uh, that he ignores the fact that the Greeks regarded Danaus as a Greek. In the case of the hero Cadmus, he overlooks the Greek tradition that Cadmus came to Thebes in Greece from Phoenicia, not from Egypt, from Phoenicia, where Phoenicia was in Canaan, the Holy Land, again, back home here, right? And accepts instead a hybrid origin. According to Greek belief, Cadmus came from Tyre in Phoenicia or Canaan and founded the Greek city of Thebes. Because uh, Diop is also saying that Cadmus is African, right? There's no proof of that. In history and mythology that we have recorded, he's coming from Phoenicia to, or Tyre, all right? And he settled the city of Thebes, the Greek, the Greek city of Thebes. All right, so uh, real quick, we go to, I uh, just want to go ahead and talk about the person she's uh, criticizing, uh, Cheek Anta Diop. All right, when it comes to uh, Pan-Africanism, he's one of the, you know, what they give credit to, you know, leading, you know. Um, so it says here, was a Senegalese historian, anthropologist, physicist, and politician who studied the human race's origin in pre-colonial African culture. Though Diop is sometimes referred to as an Afrocentrist, he predates the concept and thus was not himself an Afrocentric scholar, according to who. However, the, the opian thought, as it is called, is paradigmatic to Afrocentricity. So it's the same thing. He works, his work was greatly controversial, and throughout his career, they have argued that there was a shared cult cultural continuity across African peoples that was more important than the varied development of different ethnic groups shown by different um, differences among language and cultures over time. So he's saying it doesn't matter how many different cultures and nations and tribes, it, all that matters is the African, right? Heritage, try to group it into one place, right? Diop's work has posed questions about cultural bias and scientific research. Chick Antop University, formerly known as the University of Dakar, is named after him. The guy, he got a whole university after him. Dio's work have been criticized as revisionist and pseudo-historical. He's a revisionist and he's pseudo-historical. According to Marie Hughes uh, Warrington, Dio's work were criticized by leading French Africanists. But they and later critics noted the value of his work for the generation of a politically useful mythology. All right, we can still use your work as mythology. We'll just name it like fiction. It's just mythology. Let's just call it mythology. Thanks, Dio. That would promote African unity. Let's just keep promoting African unity through mythology. Mythology. All right. Now, real quick. Early life in Korea. Who is this guy? Born in Teotu, Durbo region, Senegal. Diop belonged to an aristocratic Muslim Wola family. Muslim. Religious, right? Muslim. Where he was educated in a traditional Islamic school. He's Islamic, right? Diop's family was part of the Moorite, Moorite, Moor, Moorite Brotherhood. All right, we're going to get into that. Moorite Brotherhood, the only independent Muslim fraternity in Africa, according to Diop. According to Diop, he obtained the colonial equivalent of the metropolitan French Baccalaureate in Senegal before moving to Paris to study for a degree. So he was very involved with uh, France and, and speaking French, and he wrote his first book in French and all that. And now, what's a baccalaureate? Look at this: the baccalaureate, often known in France, 
colloquially as the BAC, is a French national academic qualification that students can obtain at the completion of their secondary education by meeting certain requirements. It has existed since the Middle Ages. So what is these certain requirements? Who gets this diploma? Look at this from France. The guy in Senegal from France. All right. So what's the Morai? The Morai Brotherhood. It says here the Morai Brotherhood. The Morai Brotherhood is a large tariqa, right? A tariqa is a school or order of Sufism, Sufism, or specifically a concept for the mystical teachings and spiritual practices of such an order, an order with the aim of seeking hakika, which translates as ultimate truth, a order. This is a fraternal, a secret society. Sufism, especially, we already got into this. Who was involved with that? We're talking about where you know the concepts that drew ali had based on you know why they were calling him an egyptian adept where he was talking about an egyptian ancient egyptian order he was a part of that he learned that he had to initiate and join and it was under this guy Ghani jamal sufism goes back to the uh, ancient magis and the persian magical uh teachings esoteric uh Sor sorotrian sorotrian sorostrian uh teachings and all that and then that's where the uh, a lot of the branches of, of those same teachings you get the Theosophical Society of Blavatsky and all these other the Golden Dawn the Order of the Golden all these other teachings and also Egyptology even this Hermetic teachings the Hermetic Egyptian so called Egyptian ancient and we've seen that it wasn't really true we heard earlier we're gonna get a little bit more there earlier next it was more of a Freemason mythology now we see that these people are what mystical teaching spiritual practices all right so he's involved with the his family of morites amadu mamba the morite brotherhood was founded in 1803 by this uh, person right here and i just want to show you that uh, amadu mamba was a muslim mystic was a muslim mystic all right mysticism is popularly known as becoming one with god or the absolute but may refer to any kind of ecstasy or altered state of consciousness which is given a religious or spiritual meaning all right mysticism a term mysticism has ancient greek origins with various historically determined meanings again going back to what greek mysticism greek he's a what muslim mystic all right so again from an aristocratic muslim wall of family of the morite uh clan i right, mysticism sufi mystic uh, order the ancient mystic order Sufi order, all right, descendant. What does that have to do with America? And what does that have to do with ancient Egypt? Continuing in the book, it says, by now it should be clear that Diop has supplied his readers only with selected and to some extent distorted information. When he reports what the Egyptian priest told Diodorus, he says nothing about the Greeks' own earlier accounts of their origins, nor does he advise his readers to remember that in any case, all of these stories are myths, not history. As a such, they cannot provide the precise information about the timing of events or the movements of people that we would now like to possess. Right, this is chapter 4, says the myth of the Egyptian mystery system. Even after the 19th century, scholars showed that the reports of Greek visitors to Egypt misunderstood and misrepresented what they saw. The myth that Greek philosophy derived from Egypt is still in circulation. The myth is not only, only one belief, but it is being taught as if it were the truth. And as, as if no progress had been made in our knowledge of Egypt since the 18th century. How the myth has managed to survive despite all evidence and scholarship that demonstrates its falsity. It's a fascinating story in this chapter. I will describe how the notion of Egyptian legacy was preserved in the literature and ritual of Freemasonry. It was from that source that Afrocentrists learned about. All right, that's where they got there. These Afrocentrists, later to be known as Pan-Africans, right? They got their literature and rituals from Freemasonry and, and they learned about it and then sought to find confirmation for the primacy of Egypt over Greece in the fantasies of ancient writers like Herodotus and Diodorus. In the next chapter, I will discuss how and why in this century Afrocentrist writers went beyond the claims of the Freemasons who speak only of Egyptian origins and not of deliberate theft on the part of the ancient Greeks. If there were no mystery cults in Egypt, where did the idea of an Egyptian mystery system come from? George G. M. James, the author of Stolen Legacy, appears to have been misled by relying on Masonic literature. 
rather than standard histories of religion. As his principal source of information about the Egyptian mysteries, James cites a book written in 1909 by the Reverend Charles H. Vale, a 32nd degree Mason, called The Ancient Mysteries and Modern Masonry. In this book, Vale speaks of public mysteries such as those celebrated by Egyptian priests in the rites of the god Osiris and in the schools founded in Greece by initiates. He quotes directly from only one ancient source, Plutarch's on Isis and Osiris, which he claims is a description of the mysteries of Isis. With a lot of these uh, mystery teachings, and when they're talking about, yeah, this religion that started Christianity, that all started in Egypt, all that stuff, you know, um, that already, that most of that literature comes out of Toph. That's who the source is. All right, let me just read something before we go on. It says here, on the 42 books of philosophy, cataloged by Clement. Remember, these 42 books were written by Hermes or Toph. All right, we got this in my Toph video. Go check it out. The principal source of the notion that there was a corpus of Egyptian philosophy derives from yet another and even later source, the so-called Hermetica or Discourses of Hermes. All right, Hermetica, Hermetic teachings. These are writings that were supposed to have been composed at the beginning of time by Hermes the Trice Great or Trigamistus, grandson of the god Hermes, who was identified with the Egyptian god Thoth. All right, Thoth. The pagan writer Iamblichus, who believed that these discourses were authentic, says that one of the authors he consulted knew of 20,000 and another 36,525 such treatises. But the 2,000 discourses attributed to Hermes that have come down to us are not even Egyptian at all. So the ones they ver verified, rather they are treatises written in Greek centuries after the deaths of the famous Greek philosophers they purport to have inspired. So they actually verified some of these documents or whatever scrolls and they found that they're actually written by Greek people. As Isaac Casabon showed in 1614, this small collection of writings could not be as early as in Blackius and other ancient writers thought because its authors or authors were much influenced by the very writers that Hermes, the Trice Great, was supposed to have inspired, especially Plato and his much later followers, the Neplo Neplatonids. Not to mention the Hellenistic Hebrew writers known as the Gnostics. All right, Hellenistic. There is no record of any Egyptian language original from which they were derived. Listen to this. This is deep. All right. Yeah, they, they start creating this whole ancient Egypt. It was all here in Tamaria, split up between our, our stories, split up in different. It became known as so called Egypt, this mystery Egypt, right? That they created these secret societies. There was no record of any Egyptian language original from which they were derived. And it is clear from both their style and their vocabulary that they could not have been composed without the conceptual vocabulary and rhetoric developed by the Greek philosophers in the fourth century BC. It's all Greek, Hermetic teachings, Masonic teachings. One. Continuing in the book, it says here, a striking quality of Freemasonry. It's its imaginative, attachment to the religion and symbolism of the Egyptians. The Egypt to which the Masons referred to, of course, an imaginary one, but this was the Egypt that was rediscovered in the Renaissance for convenience, all right? It was an imaginary one, the one they taught us. I shall call it mystical Egypt to distinguish it from the historical Egypt that was first explored scientifically and understood only in the 19th century. They're talking about when they actually went into that place over there. They call it Egypt. He's talking about. But other than that, the ancient one, they didn't know anything about that. It was all imaginary. Listen to what they're telling you. Remember, they told they didn't know how Egypt started. It was a legacy. Remember, it's all a mystery. That's what they told us all our life. So again, she's going to call it a mystical Egypt. European writers learned about mystical Egypt from the writings of the church fathers. They knew the hermetic treatise known as Aclepius because it had survived in Latin version and they supposed that it was one of the books of Hermes to which Clement of Alexandria referred in his description of the procession of Egyptian priests. So around 1460 when a Greek manuscript containing most of the hermetic treatises was brought to Florence, Cosimo de Medici thought that it was more important to translate them than the works of Plato because Egypt was before Greece. Hermes was earlier than Plato. As a result of this huge historical error, the Hermetic corpus was given serious attention. 
and its fictions were widely accepted as truth. All right, Hermetic teachings, remember, all that comes from Thoth. Although the theology of Hermetica, now what is, why keep saying Thoth? What's the significance of Thoth? You're saying, well, Thoth is Egyptian. No, Thoth is actually what? He said it himself. From where? Atlantis, or in the Book of the Dead, he's a Westerner. He's a Western from a distant Western land. His, he was from a land where he lived in a city and a lake, and there was two volcanoes there. There were volcanoes in the city and the lake, all right? That, that doesn't exist in, in Egypt today. There's no volcanoes there. You get what I'm telling you? So Thoth, he know in the Emerald Tablets, he was Atlantean, all right? Where's Atlantis, so-called Atlantis? We're talking about ancient America. Here. We're talking about the Western Ethiopians, as the Greeks would call the Amaru, because the Western Ethiopia. Continuing in the book, not out of Africa, it says here, although after 1614 it became known that the books of Hermes were not what they appeared to be, and some 200 years after that it was shown definitely that Horapolo's interpretation of hieroglyphics were wrong, the fundamental notions of Egypt expressed in these works and in the Renaissance philosophy connected with them were preserved in Freemasonry. The Masons believed that their initiation rituals was dated from the earliest times and that it was modeled on the mysteries of Egypt and of other ancient countries. They preserved as part of their own secret symbolism, alchemical science, again, alchemical, alchemy, chem, science and hieroglyphics, that is, hieroglyphics as interpreted by Horapolo. One of these is familiar to everyone in this country. It is the Great Seal of the United States, the Unfinished Pyramid, whose detached top is an eye surrounded by brilliant rays. Some of our founding fathers were Freemasons, including George Washington himself. The Treasury Department now explains that the pyramid is unfinished because the government is new, and that is sunburst and the eye above the pyramid standing for the deity. deity. Why did they choose these particular symbols? As Masons, they wished to emphasize their connection with the great civilization of Egypt. The explanation of the eye surrounded by a sunburst can be found in Horapolo, the eye of the hawk symbolizes sublimity and divinity, and it is associated with the sun because of the sharp sighted rays of its vision and Masonic symbolism. An eye and a triangle radiating rays of light stands for the grand architect of the universe, the architect. So we have uh, this supposed Freemasonry of the ancient Egyptians, which really came up out in the 1700s. All right, again, this is all from the Hermetic libraries, right? We already learned about Hermetism and where that comes out of. And this book says here, from Manly P. Hall, most of you know a lot of this uh, esoteric, uh, you know, following uh, of uh, these people, like Manly P. Hall and Aleister Crowley and all that. It says here, Freemasonry of the Ancient Egyptians. It says here, there are two sections of this volume, each of distinct significance. The first is Hall's essay, Freemasonry of the Ancient Egyptians which is principally analysis of the Osiris legend. We're given some references to Atlantean civilization. The analysis is sober and comprehensive, but the most worthwhile part is Hall's own proposed interpretation, which constitutes a few final pages of the essay. Again, so again, all this ancient Egyptian uh, teachings that we had, it's always has been based upon this uh, Europeanized view or this Masonic view of what they pictured ancient egypt like and their legends right and legend a legend all right so it says the second part of the book is publication of the krata report now this is important the krata report what's the krata report all right much love and respect to lotus lotus for the knowledge for the drop lotus put me on to the krata report and how they are uh, basically very influential to a lot of other secret organizations or societies or orders, the Krata Repoa, in particular the Rosicrucians, we're going to see. It says an 18th century manuscript purporting to detail the initiatory system of ancient Egypt. All right, supposedly, so this came about when? The 18th century, was that 1700s? Right, 1700s, purporting, it was purporting, supposedly, to detail how it was in ancient Egypt, Krata report first appeared anonymously, or anonymously in German in the late 18th century, drawn on a wide range of classical sources for its details. Some of those sources were sympathetic to the ancient mysteries, but others were certainly hostile. Given the strict laws of secrecy that surrounded the classical rights, we can only assume that the best informed and most sympathetic accounts from antiquity were never disclosed. 
The English text published by Hall is based on John Darker's translation from the French of Anton Bailu, who published his version in 1778, 1700s. All right, was when this all started, this whole ancient Egyptian uh, perspective that they gave us in the Kata Repoa. The Kata Repoa. All right, it says here, or initiations into the ancient secret society of the Egyptian priest. 1785. Look at this. Nick Farrell, Rome, 2009. He translated it. It was written in the 1700s. Says the introduction. This small and largely forgotten work was influential in the development of the Western mystery tradition. Western mystery tradition of the mystery schools, the secret orders, concepts, and the belief in the idea of a particular type of initiation system or the mysteries were first formed by this text. All right. Hermetic. Historically, its claims are bogus or unlikely, but have been upheld by groups that use it as a template, including the European esoteric Freemasonic groups. These in turn influence the English-speaking Rosicrucian orders, the Rosicrucian orders, all of them, the Rosicrucians. We're going to see who was under the Rosicrucians, including the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, the Hermetic Order. This is Aleister Crowley and all these people that were in it. Uh, I forget the, what this means, but this is another order of Alistair Crowley I was in, the a the ancient uh, Masonic order of the Rosic, something like that, Rosicrucians. And we're going to read a book of theirs, letting us know that ancient Egypt was really in America. Ancient Egypt was really in America. Builders of the Aditum and Dion Fortune. The book was popular in Germany, and I was given a German copy by the Sodalitas Rosicrucis and Solis Alae. But I just want you guys to know and this is what they're getting all this uh, ancient Egyptian Freemasonry and uh, influencing these uh, orders and the Rosicrucians. And we continue to have this website here, the squaremagazine.com. It says Freemasonry and Egyptomania. Look at this image right here Freemasonry and Egyptomania. It says here, however, the Egyptian rite says, however, probably the largest influence on Freemasonry with regards to its possible Egyptian roots were the free thinkers of the Age of Enlightenment. In Europe during the mid to late 1700s, again in the 1700s, a revival of the Renaissance, Hermetism, Hermetic teachings, right? Hermetism and alchemy. Alchemy, again, became the rigor with irregular offshots of masonry sprouting across the continent. Much of the Egyptian revival Freemasonry, spirituality and theory was in fact merely a mixture of Christianity, Judaism, Kabbalah and alchemy, Kabbalah, Kabbalistic, Kabbalah. It's all the same. It's all from the Krata report. It's all from this 1700s Masonic uh, mythology, right? Freemasonic mythology, as we learned earlier. A mixture with mixing a little bit of Christianity, Judaism, Kabbalah, and alchemy, none of which had any proven basis in the roots of actual ancient Egypt. None of them can prove they were talking about ancient Tamari, the real Tamari. Or what they, they created this idea out of Egypt, this place that they were envisioning, this beloved land to marry this beloved land, this promised land, this ancient fertile soil of a, a great river, a great place, right? Civilization that had plenty of corn and all that. They were envisioning, they created this Masonic mythology and created this Egypt, this Greek version of Egypt. Right, so they can't. There's nothing to prove their basis and the ancient roots, and we're more from a romanticized notion than factual base. All right, this core group of European Masons were proponents of the purported esoteric origin of the order. They added Freemasonry to the melting pot of traditions, religions, and mystical thought that had been brewing since the Renaissance, including the idea that alchemy and the Hermetic arts had filtered down from the teachings of ancient Egypt. They made that up. They brought that out in the 1700s. They made it up. They said it started in Egypt. They made that up. You can start to see the pattern. There's a lot of people saying this and showing you. The concept of ancient initiatory or mystery schools was too enticing to pass up, and it became the focus point of various new Masonic rituals with a supposedly Egyptian theme. The combination of dirgy, the invocation of a deity and Freemasonry was present in various new rituals. The Rite of Misraim, 1738, Martinez de Pasqua's Order of Ilus Cohen, 1767, 
Pagliostro's Egyptian Rights, 1784, and later a variant on Mizraim's The Right of Memphis, 1838, which further morphed into the ancient and primitive right of Memphis, Mizraim in 1889. You see, they started getting popular during these times with these orders, these secret societies. There was no real connection, people. Listen, there was no real connection, all you Pan-Africans. There's no real connection to ancient Egypt or to Mary or over here in America within any of these rituals. The etymology of the, many of the Egyptian words are often portmentuous or corruptions of existing mystical races or in other cases, inventions by the authors. Inventions by the authors, the Greek words, most sung. This is further compounded when one considers the language of hieroglyphics had not yet been deciphered until much later via the crucial breakthrough of Thomas Young and Jean-Francois Champollion. And even then, were not widely published. So that was a big point right there. You got to emphasize on that, right? Listen, if you guys don't understand, they, you know, Europeans supposedly didn't know anything about Egypt or even how to read or interpret hieroglyphics before the 1830s you understand that so how are they interpreting egyptian ancient egypt in the 1700s if they couldn't read it this is what he's talking about how are they deciphering stuff they 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 hadn't even learned how to supposedly decipher it because they only learned it through the supposed rosetta stone that they found right napoleon and the french now that's a whole mystery right there all right that we're going to get into and investigate but again he made a point right here. How they even, how did they have all this knowledge of ancient Egypt where they couldn't even read hieroglyphics, supposedly, in mainstream? From these facts, one can logically surmise that at the time most of these rituals were written, they contain no evidence-based wisdom of the ancients. Much of the content had its roots in hybr hybridized blend of biblical, probabilistic, or alchemical symbolism. The right of Memphis even managed to combine elements from Templarism and chivalry with Egyptian and alchemical symbolism. All right, it's all Masonic. It has nothing to do with being from Africa or a Pan-African. It's all Masonic symbolism. The quasi-Masonic orders were incredibly influential amongst the occultists and more spiritual Freemasons. And by the fin de siècle in the early 1900s, the new age had well and truly dawned the melting pot on the verge of boiling over from the traditional history of regular Freemasonry. A many-headed hydra had been created, one that would invariably lead Freemasonry as an organization into centuries of ill repute so that's how they put themselves on the map you see yo now we we're ancient we we go all the way back to egypt we've been in order we've been in clubs no they stole that knowledge we know we already know that freemasonic is the study of sacred geometry of architecture and how to build the pyramids and all that you know mound building right whole techie so they stole this knowledge and they were like okay you know what we gotta act like we're from way back we gotta we gotta put ourselves in history that's what they did when they created this ancient egypt so they created their reputation to add insult to injury alistair crowley all right alistair crowley the figure later dubbed the wickedest man in the world would attach himself to the perimeters of free masonry why is he called the wickedest man in the world from the fusion of two rites of Mizraim and Memphis and the ensuing intervention of John Jarker and Theodore Roos, the rites metamorphed once again into the quasi-Masonic mixed gender, Ordo Templi Orientis, all right? That's what the OTO meant. Again, that was from all these people as the founders, you see. It's all based on the same kind of Sokokrata report or this ancient Egyptian Freemasonry, which is really her holistic her hermetic teachers that were revived in the 1700s the hermetic order of the golden dawn was another short-lived esoteric masonic styled order founded by freemasons william Wynne westcott and samuel Lydon mcgregor mathers both members of the societas rosicruciana you see rosicrucian in anglia aside from the rituals the european freemasons left up anything that hinted of egypt Jean Abbott Terrasson's novel, Life of Setos, taken from private memoirs of the ancient Egyptians, 1731, was an elaborate work of fictional fantasy. It's a fictional book, all right? And was a source of inspiration for Mozart's opera, The Magic Flute. 
which combined both masonry and ancient Egyptian symbolism. Mozart also wrote incidental music for Tamos, King of Egypt, a play by Tobias Philip, Baron von Gebler, Count Gagliostro, creator of the Egyptian rite and self-styled Grand Copta, held sciences in his Egyptian themed salon in Paris. Are uh, you hear all these these people just playing make believe? Goethe, 1749 to 1832, even wrote a play about it all in 1792 entitled Der Gross Copta, the Grand Copt. All right. So if you want to fact check any of this, feel free to let me know how it goes. All right. So it's very deep. Again, there's no historical basis on any of this as to lead to ancient roots. Continue just real quick in this website. Uh, it says here the AMR or the AMORC, the Rosicrucian Order, it says the ancient and mystical order of the Rosicrucians. And just to uh, correlate, it says here the Rosicrucian movement, of which the Rosicrucian Order, AMORC, is the most prominent modern representative, has its roots in mystery traditions, philosophy, and myths of ancient Egypt dating back to the approximate 1500 BC. So that's the hijack. All right. We just realized, we just read it was actually from the 1700s. So this is what they were trying to do. This is how they get their initiates and uh, recruit people. Talking about it's from uh, the 1500s uh, BC. All right. So, uh, well, this brings us over to, I could keep going about the links of Freemasonry and the ancient Egyptian, um, you know, perspective they gave us. It's the whole history that they gave us and the connection of uh, all this hermetic teachings in ancient Greeks really telling us the story but um, it brings us to Kemetism right we know Kemet is black soil we just saw the word definition the etymology you know it has nothing to do with a landmass in Africa so what is Kemetism then it has nothing to do with a landmass in Africa what is Kemetism now there's three forms of this all right let's go over this real quick it says Kemetism from Kemet the native name of ancient Egypt right Native, remember that means black soil. So not they're not talking about Africa. It's a term for neo-pagan revivals. A term for neo-pagan, neo-pagan, new pagans, revivals of ancient Egyptian religion, which developed in the United States from the 1970s. All right. This came about in the 1970s. This ain't ancient at all. There are three main groups, each of which take a different approach to their beliefs, ranging from eclect eclectic to polytheistic reconstructionism. Now, the first one says here is Kemetic Wicca. Wicca or witchcraft, right? Kemetic Wicca. Also, Tamarin, Tamari, Tamarin Wicca from Tamari, land of the two riverbanks. Another native term for Egypt, Tamari, is an eclectic approach combining ancient Egyptian elements with Wicca, a religion based on pagan practices which utilizes witchcraft. All right? Does that have to do with anything? Now, this one says Kemetic revivalism and reconstruction a reconstruction is which include academic approaches informed by egyptology notably kemetic orthodoxy all right now kemetic teachings and orthodoxies of the actual religion of kemetic orthodoxy is actually funded by tamara el suida a white lady and carrie wishner's akhet hawat hawar and uh this is tamara el suida right here <laughs> as you can see all right this is Tamara. She's the founder of Kemetic Orthodoxy or Religion. And yeah, she'd be having people dress up, you know. But that's her right here. Yes, this white lady. The founder of Kemetic Orthodoxy, Kemetic Religion. All right, Tamara El Suida. Okay. Now the third they say is the Asr Asid of Ra Un Nefer Amen. All right, it's a syncretic pan-Africanist approach targeted at the African diaspora, targeted at you, so-called African-American, at the African diaspora. History and demographics says Kemetic revivalism appears in the 1970s with the rise of neo-paganism in the United States. The Church of the Eternal Source, promoting New Age receptions of Egyptian spiritualism founded in 1970, and the Osir Osset Society promoting Pan-Africanism, founded in 1973, all right? That started when? In 1973, Osir Osset Society. Who is this and what does that have to do with any of this in Pan-Africanism and Kemetic today, Kemetic teachings? It says Tamara Suida's Kemetic Orthodoxy, remember the white lady, 
following in the late 1980s and Kerry Wisner's academic reconstructionism in the 1990s. All right, this is where they get all this comedic stuff from. The movement is composed of a mixture of New Age Wicca and Afrocentrism. The latter, in the context of Afrocentrist Egyptology, Afrocentrist Egyptology, which emerged in the United States in the 1990s. You're still you're stuck in the 1990s. And you're Pan-African. That's Afrocentrist Egyptology. This emerged in the 1990s, making ancient Egypt a black culture. All right. Oh, you see what they're saying? So-called black. This correlated says here in the late 1980s, chemitism had become so popular in the United States that its adherents began to organize, create institutions, and develop different branches of the faith. In particular, an early leader of the movement was Tamara El Suida. Who will ultimately become responsible for the development of Kemetic Orthodoxy? All right, personal Kemetic shrine. <laughs> so, yeah, as a college student, Suida was a follower of Wiccan rituals. She was a witch, Wiccan during a Wiccan initiation. Right, she experienced a powerful connection with what she later understood to be several ancient Egyptian deities. She says she she got in contact with the ancient pharaohs. That's just like the other. Um, uh, You know, like Blavatsky and all that, Alistair Crowley and all them. They said they talked to these ancient Egyptian deities. Are these really fallen angels? What are these things they're talking to? This led her to deepen her knowledge and interest in Kemetism. And ultimately, she founded Kemetic Orthodoxy in 1989. We got the other one. That's the Aser Asid Society of Ra Un Nefer Amen. So first of all, who is Ra Un Nefer Amen? It says here, Ra Un Nefer Amen. Born Rogelio Alcides, Rogelio Alcides Strong, on January 1944, is the founder of the Osser Osses Society, a Pan-African spiritual organization dedicated to providing Afrocentric-based spiritual training to people of African descent. All right, so to African descent, Afrocentric-based spiritual, Afrocentric, really? Is that what you guys are teaching in the Osser Osses Society, Afrocentric stuff? Or after center based spirituality, really? Are you sure it's not no Greek hermetic stuff? Are you sure it's not none of that? All right, so Rogelio, I'll see this strong. So we're in the Encyclopedia of Black Studies. Encyclopedia of Black Studies. So it says here that Ra Un Nefer Amen I was born Rogelio, again, I'll see this strong. Rogelio in Panama, so he's Panamanian. Rogelio. Rogelio, that's a Spanish name, right? Rogelio, all right? The so-called Raul Nefer Amenai was actually a Panamanian-born Rogelio Alcides, strong, strong. And real quick, strong history, family crest, coat of arms, strong is a Scottish and Irish surname. Strong is an Irish and Scottish surname. So when I say strong, and he's a Pan-African now, and now he was born in Panama. Now you tell me, Can you prove to me he goes all the way back to Africa? And I says he was raised by his mother and stepfather. So this ain't his dad. The strong and it's not him. According to what it says here, his mom is Goody Koo and Bertram Strong is the dad. Goody Koo and Bertram Strong. So I did a little bit of genealogy. I can't find anything on a Goody Koo or that word or anything to do in Panama. Nothing. Even the Bertram Strong is difficult to find. Because it was, again, this is supposed stepfather. He attended the Conservatory of Music, where at age six he studied piano and music theory. As a child, he also read periodicals and texts his grandfather's Panama's first dental surgeon. So his grandfather was Panama's first dental surgeon. That's a very important job. These these are people who are well off. This is not a peasant poor family. Slave family doesn't sound like yet. All right, his again grandfather was Panama's first dental surgeon, who had become nearly blind. He read to his grandfather Times Magazine, Newsweek newspaper equivalent, two New York Times, and philosophy texts such as Plato's Republic. As a strong attended a high school that produced Panama's president, so he went to a very elite high school. Strong, he's from a well-off family. You hear what I'm showing you, right? Where he studied history, political science, music, and literature. He read the works of Che Guevara, Pablo Neruda, and Jose Marti as a youngest member of the Federation of Panamanian Students. He protested with the peasants who fought against Panama's seeding land to Costa Rica. 
After coming to America with his parents in 1960, he protested against the Vietnam War with students for a democratic society. He also continued his spiritual search in 1962. He completely changed his diet after learning about the effects of vitamins and minerals on health. He concluded that divine spiritual potency combined with healthy living could solve the world's problems. During the 1960s, he participated in various black power organizations, Black Power, until he established his own group based on achieving higher realms of consciousness. Osir Osir members attempt to live according to divine laws from ancient theologies. All right, so Rogelio, Rogelio this Panamanian guy, founded the Osir Osir Society, another word for Osiris, Osir, right, supposedly, you know, so... Just uh, again, it says here that it's a Pan-African religious organization. It's a religious organization. Again, religious, religious. A lot of Pan-Africans try to like come at the Hebrews or anybody using religion. And they're also a religious organization founded in 1973 by Ra'u Nefra for the purpose of providing members a social societal framework through the which the Kemetic spiritual way of life can be lived and to promote Rosicrucian values. Again, Rosicrucian values, the Rosicrucian Masonic order. Remember, the Rosicrucian comes from the Krata Rapoa. Remember, that's all hermetic teachings. Remember, that's all Freemasonry. This is what foundation of all this supposed ancient Egypt, which was myths based on mythology, which was all Freemasonry symbology. So, wait a minute, Osir, Osir Society, Pan African. Wait, promoting Rosicrucian values? Rosicrucian values. Are you seeing this? All right, so we're in encyclopedia.com and it says here the Osser Osser Society. It says the Osser Osser Society, a Rosicrucian body. All right, a Rosicrucian order, a Freemasonic, esoteric, this mythological ancient Egypt, this mythological, this fake Egypt, its hermetic teachings, this Rosicrucian body, especially oriented to meet the needs of African Americans was founded in the mid-1970s by R.A. Strong, Rogelio, okay? His name was Rogelio. He's from, he's, he's, he's mi compa de Panama. Strong, formerly the head of the Rosicrucian Anthropological League. He was what? R.A. Strong, Rogelio Strong was what? The head of the Rosicrucian Anthropological League in New York City. All right, Rosic, he was the head of it. Did you know that? Oh, you thought it was all about Africa and African spirituality, right? You thought he was just bringing back the ancestors' uh, religion, right? You thought that he was so, so he was just, you know, promoting Africa, Africa, right? But he's from Panama, from a well-off family in Panama, right? With an Irish-Scottish surname, Spanish name, right? And he's a Rosicrucian follower, esoteric. When you go into the study of who he is, he was very esoteric. He taught a lot of, like they're saying, he had a lot of uh, esoteric writings. And he was like a jogi. He was all into the whole Hindu culture as well. Very jogi, meditative, hermetic teachings, all that. Rogelio, yes. Very little information can be found. And trust me, I tried. All right. But he was definitely, what, the head of the Rosicrucian Anthropological League in New York City. It says, under his adopted name, Ra'u Nefer Amen has written a number of occult texts, occult texts on Hermetic, again, Hermetic, Hermetic, again, Hermes, Thoth, and Eastern religions. What does he know about this? You know, he's a Freemason. He also developed a unique tarot card deck. The program of the society is directed to people of African origin and its literature regularly integrates more familiar cult themes with material specific to African American, emphasizing lessons in African American history and the accomplishments of Africans. All right, so he's basically letting you know straight up that he targeted so called black people in America. He targeted with this Rosicrucian, Rosicrucian teachings, esoteric, hermetic, hermetic occult teachings. So the Rosicrucian Anthroposophic League, Harlem, in Harlem, all right? It says that it's filed uh, to be a nonprofit corporation on March 8th, 1935. That's how long it's been there, since 1935. So, yeah, it's real. The Rosicrucian Anthroposophic League, continuing, it says here, the Rosicrucian Anthroposophical League. It says the Rosicrucian Anthroposophical League was founded in 1932 by Samuel Richard Parchman, an astrologer and occultist. 
who trained with Max Heindel. All right, who's Max Heindel? During the 1920s, Parchman became a leader in the Rosicrucian Fellowship, founded by Heindel, which publishes early writings. However, he broke away from the fellowship after Heindel's death and formed an independent organization out of the former Fellowship Center in San Francisco. Parchman is best remembered as the author of classic textbooks of astrology, mundane, and spiritual, which was used by many astrologers not affiliated with the League and later reprinted by the American Federation of Astrologers. All right, so let me just go down here. It says here that after Parchman's lifetime, League centers developed in both coasts, but in recent years, little has been heard of it. Its present status is unknown. It says here that in the 1970s, though, the New York League became the Independent Osser Osset Society. The New York part of the what? The Rosicrucian Anthropological Society became the Osser Osset Society. Rosicrucians. The Rose Cross. All right. The Rosicrucians and all the history behind it. All right. That's the hijack. He's going to talk a little bit about some of the fraternities of the Rosicrucians. This is one of them. Several Rosicrucian groups have direct lineage from the Theosophical Society. Madame Blavatsky, right? The largest one being the Rosicrucian Fellowship funded by Max Heindel. So he was coming from Blavatsky's teachings. Max Heindel, who actually helped influence what? The other Rosicrucian Anthropologic Society League. Heindel, born Carl Louis von Grasshoff, was an engineer whose occult interest led him to the Theosophical Society shortly after the beginning of the century. By 1905, he was a Theosophical lecturer. Then in 1907, he traveled to Germany, where he appeared to him several times, one whom he described as an elder brother of the Rosicrucian order. He was sent to work with a knowledgeable teacher, believed by most to have been Rudolf Steiner, founder of the, of the Anthroposophical Society. You see where all this is coming from? And this turned to the Osir Osset Society, Pan-Africanism, Kemetic. Listen, so what is the point, Kurimel? Well, the point is... Where's all that so-called African history when all this was just mysticism? Even the other dude, Diop, remember he was from the Muslim mystic order, mysticism, mystic order, who's going to lead back to the same people. Same people, these Persians, these same people, these theosophical society of Blavatsky, it's the same people she learned from that went out into the Muslim Islam world. Same people. All right? So where's ancient Egypt really when the supposed real one is all a myth? It's all Freemasonry symbolism. It's all hermetic teachings. It's all hijack. So Ra'u Nefer Amen, right? So what's his significance? Well, to accomplish this goal, he has written and published several books on the subject of ancient Egyptian philosophy and spiritual culture. Most notably, the Metu Netter and the Metu Netter Oracle, the Metu Netter. All right. So I clicked on Metu Netter and it brought me to Egyptian hieroglyphics. How does that happen? Right. <laughs> so I actually got volume one of Metu Netter, volume one here by Raumen Nefer, aka Rogelio, mi compa Rogelio de Panama. Rogelio. <laughs> Rogelio, man, he was from an elite family in Panama. I want to I want to see I want to see his African genealogy. Somebody please prove it to me. Now, in his book Metu Netter Volume 1 by Raun Amen Nefer right here. I just want you to I uh, I wanted to point out something. Uh, again, shout out to uh, Lotus for pointing this out to me that a lot of these translations that they're getting their so-called hieroglyphics uh, translations and interpretations like this this these these uh uh, Rosicrucian, these esoteric teachers, right? These Freemasons. It's actually from a lot of these same people, as in their same people, Germans, these Jewish people, these Germans, Nazi people. Like one of them is Adolf Ehrman. Adolf Ehrman. So Adolf Ehrman and Hermann Grappel says the hieroglyphic dictionary of Ehrman and Grappel in the six original volumes. This is a translation of it again um, it's in the 1800s. And this is in German right here so this is again written by that guy Ehrman and Grappo it says that this dictionary is one of the greatest intellectual achievements of the 20th century albeit known to few outside of Egyptology indeed it is probably the greatest single achievement ever accomplished in Egyptological textual studies all right so again they're giving the credit to these two guys right here 
this Jewish German guy, uh, Adolf Adolf Ehrman, and this Nazi Herman Grappau. Yeah, he was a Nazi. Yeah, so this guy's a, a Nazi. So they're probably occultists too. Uh, may have some Masonic uh, connections, but they're giving credit to you know translating it really good. And a lot of the uh, today's uh, modern uh, trans uh, sources or references is from their dictionary. So I just wanted to show that um, Ra'u Nefer right here, Rogelio, is quoting, right? This is his book, Metu Netter, Volume 1. It says, I will quote from Life in Ancient Egypt by Adolf Ehrman, Dover Press, which will prove very enlightening. You're going to be very enlightened by Adolf Ehrman, Rogelio's telling us. All right, so he's learning from Adolf Ehrman, right? Rogelio, let me show you again. Metu Netter, this is Metu Netter. Volume 1, right? Volume 1 by Ra'un Amen Nefer, right? He's quoting Adolf Ehrman. It says, which will be enlightening. All right, he's quoting Adolf Ehrman. Adolf Ehrman. So again, this all happened after the 1830s, right? This translation. So how did these people in the 1700s, how did they know anything about ancient Egypt? They couldn't even read it. If these guys were one of the first people to supposedly... You know, translate it good and put it, create a dictionary for people to, you know, have a reference. So this is another his book. It says Egyptian grammar with table signs and bibliography exercises for reading and glossary by Adolf Ehrman, translated by James Henry Breasted. All right, from 1894. And just some examples of the, what's in the book. All right, as you can see. So we're getting all the translation from this German guy. The now, another of the uh, sources that we get a lot of the hieroglyphic definitions or dictionary translations of the so-called, you know, supposed uh, hieroglyphics is from um, E.A. Wallace Budge or Sir Ernest Alfred Wallace uh, Budge. Uh, his dictionary is very uh, thorough. I, I've used it before in some of my videos. For example, right here, we got Tamera, the land of Mera. Example, Egypt, Tameri, Tamera. You see the cross, All right? You see the symbol with the cross very significant right we already got that it means civilized the civilized land Samara. and again ea wallace budge all right we just saw his dictionary egyptologist orientalist and philologist who worked on the british museum he was the curator there for a while he had a lot of connections he was knighted he was knighted for his service to egyptology knighted you know, not, not just anybody gets knighted. Now down here it says, now down here it says, Budge was also interested in the paranormal and believed in spirits and hauntings. Budge had a number of friends in the Ghost Club of British Library Manuscript Collections, Ghost Club Archives, a group in London committed to the study of alternative religions and the spirit world. He told his many friends stories of hauntings and other uncanny experiences. Many people in his day who were involved with the occult and spiritualism, all right? People that were involved with that, a lot of people were. After losing their faith in Christianity, were dedicated to Budge's work, particularly his translation of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Such writers as the poet William Butler Yeats. I, William Butler Yeats? Really? And Joyce... James Joyce studied and were influenced by this work of ancient religion. So Budge, William E. Budge translated the Book of the Dead, right? And William Butler Yeats and this guy were influenced by who are these guys? So Y.B. Yeats, William Butler Yeats, an Irish poet, dramatic prose writer, and one of the foremost figures of the 20th century literature. Oh, really? So during 1885, Jesus was involved in the formation of the Dublin Hermetic Order, Hermetic teachings, Hermetic. See how it all goes around circle with these people. They're all influenced by the same people, same thing, teachings. The society held its first meeting on June 16th with Jesus acting as its chairman. The same year, the Dublin Theosophical Lodge was opened in conjunction with Brahmin Mohini Chattari, who traveled from the Theosophical Society. All right, it says Theosophy is a religion established in the United States during the late 19th century. It was founded primarily by the Russian immigrant Helena Blavatsky. All right, Blavatsky. And then her connection goes all the way back to Jamal Afghani, the Persian, the Sufi. The Sufi, just like Diop is a Sufi mystic. It all goes round circle. All these people are agents, 
all this pan-Africanism based on this whole Masonic symbolism and hermetic teachings, theosophical, this uh, fake Egyptian uh, Freemasonic mythology. It says Jeets attended his first seance the following year. He later became heavily involved in the theosophy and with hermetism. Hermetism. Remember, we learned about that hermetrisgamestus, particularly with eclectic Rosicrucianism. Rosicrucian, just like the Oscar Society, just like Roheli was a Rosicrucian of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. During seances held from any type of spirit callings of Leo Africanus, apparently claimed that it was Jeet's daemon. Demon? What is a demon? It's an ancient Greek daemon which really referred to a late lesser deity or guiding spirit such as the demons of ancient Greek religion and mythology in our later Hellenistic religion and philosophy. All right? Demon sounds like daemon or demon or anti-self inspiring some of the speculations in Pyramila. So you see how these people are into the occult. All right. You see, this all goes around. All right. So before we uh, get off this topic now, just want to give a sample of one Pan-African. Uh, famous Pan-African. Most of these Pan-Africans, they have the same story. You can do a future videos on all of them. You can, it will take me hours to talk about all of them, but this is just one example. Again, Martin Robinson Delaney was an African-American abolitionist, journalist, physician, soldier, and writer, and arguably the first proponent of black nationalism. Delaney is credited with the Pan-African slogan of Africa for Africans. Born as a free person of color in Charleston, Virginia, he was a free person of color. He wasn't a slave. All right. Raised in Chamber and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Delaney trained as a physician's assistant. That sounds like an apprentice. Maybe his parents gave him up as an apprentice. During the cholera epidemics of 1833 and 1854, this is before slavery was over. So what do you mean he grew up as a physician's assistant? Delaney treated patients even though many doctors and residents fled city out of fear. All right. He says in 1850, Delaney was one of the first three black men admitted to Harvard Medical School, but all were dismissed after a few weeks because of widespread protests by white students all right so all right so uh this is one of uh martin ardelani's books actually right here that's his picture right here it says the origins and objects of ancient freemasonry its introduction into the united states and legitimacy among colored men again here's a original copy the origin and object of ancient freemasonry ancient freemasonry freemason introductions of the united states and legitimacy among colored men a treatise delivered before the saint cyprian lodge number 13 in 1853 by who mr mr delani all right from a free person of color he's a freemason talking about africa for africans trying to send everybody to africa a freemason another freemason with all this pan-africanism